So uh, let me say good morning, everyone in Montana. Thank you for having me. And thank you for your interest in NAMI's first book, which I'm going to spend about a half an hour telling you a little bit about. Uh, I encourage uh, Gary and Kurt to sign your books if you have them in the room. If you don't, I'm going to tell you how to get them and how you can continue to leverage our fairly intense success. Uh, so, Tim, can you go to the first slide for me? Ah, here we go. Can everybody see these slides? Okay, great. All right, You Are Not Alone is the name of NAMI's first book. And I am honored to be the author of your first book. I think you can see these are screenshots from the 130 people that I chatted with during the book. You can see some handsome Montana lads uh, in your uh, lower left corner. Uh, thank you, Gary, for introducing me. I'm sorry I wasn't able to hear it. Uh, your work and your uh, quote in the book and yours, Kurt, is very valuable and will help a lot of people. So what I wanted for NAMI was to have a book so that NAMI wasn't the best kept secret. And it was important to me for us to have a book and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the book. And I'm also going to encourage you to consider talking to your local library. About 2,000 books have been purchased by local libraries. And in addition to bookstores, the audiobook, which is already out, the Kindle, uh, we've done very well with our book. And my goal that NAMI would not be a well kept secret is, I think, going to be happening. So uh, we made the USA Today bestseller list. So the next version of You Are Not Alone will have a jacket copy that will say national bestseller. That's kind of fun. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so what is NAMI? You know all about what NAMI is, but I wanted to show you some more people in our community. Again, these are all interviews done by Zoom. And uh, then I took the transcript from Zoom, Zoom, sent them to people and asked if they were interested in you know, having these quotes used to teach other people. So uh, I wanna know you to know how grateful I am to the 130 people who use their name in the book to reduce shame and isolation which as we all know, causes a lot of heartache and can be a killer in the field of mental health. So let's take a look at our amazing programs, classes, and initiatives. If you look at this, you would think we need to have a book. NAMI has an incredible platform, and I am proud to say that five publishers bid on our book. This is our book. All the royalties go to NAMI. NAMI owns the copyrights. I have zero rights to this book. It's a dream of mine and it's a gift, you know, to the field, to our community. And uh, let's take a look at some of these programs that we have. I interviewed people who were connected to many of these programs. So NAMI Homefront, I spoke to Anita Heron. NAMI Peer to Peer, I interviewed Kath, Catherine McNulty who invented Peer to peer. Brenda Hillegoss invented Elding the Silence. Uh, NAMI Family to Family. I interviewed Joyce Burland and multiple families whose lives have been improved so much by family to family. In Our Own Voice Saved a Woman's Life. You can read that story uh, in the book. And NAMI Provider is very strong in Iowa. And I interviewed a doctor who used that program to improve his understanding of the lived experience of mental health. The secret sauce of this book is real people share their stories. And this is uh, capturing a sense of untapped wisdom that we have not attended to in the mental health field. I'm going to take you to the next slide. So on that point, most every mental health book stays on the left, evidence-based research. Here are the research studies that show, here's what you need to do. If you look at the right side of the page, you have almost nothing other than memoirs, which I like a good memoir, 
but I don't find them practically helpful. Uh, so experience-based evidence. I have people in this book who've been living with conditions for a decade or two, and they've learned something. Their families have figured out how to communicate better. And I think it's really important that we collectively value what people have learned from their own experience. And so the book is a synthesis of both of these ideas. The idea that real people who use their names have learned things, they're a source of wisdom, and that uh, evidence-based research. I did have America's most famous researchers answer all the common questions I get at NAMI conventions. How do you talk to somebody who doesn't want to get help? Do I really have to take these meds forever? Is there anything besides medications I can do to help with my psychosis? So I asked famous researchers. That's on the left side of the page, but the secret sauce of the book is the right side of the page, the evidence-based experience. All right, I'm going to go to the next slide. If you want to check out uh, this is a website which shows I've been to 20 cities and I'm not in Montana. NAMI Montana is one of my all time favorite NAMI state organizations. The Mahelish family has done an unbelievable job of rallying that community. Matt Kuntz is, of course, a national leader uh, in the NAMI community. It's simply the way the book tour broke that I'm not with you in person. I uh, did a month on the road. Uh, I have a bad back, a cold, and I'm tired. And I built in nine days at home to recover from the undoubted infectious disease that I would pick up hopping 16 airplanes and traveling America. And uh, I also wanted to see my wife and dog. I thought it'd be a good for idea for me. I'm on the road again to Ann Arbor next week. I'm doing four events in Michigan. So I don't want you to take any offense. I love NAMI Montana and I will be honored to come at a future date. It just so happens that the, the way it broke, uh, Maryland, NAMI Maryland, NAMI Illinois, um, and several others are getting virtual presentations. So please don't take any insult in that. I'm extremely fond of NAMI Montana, and I have been there, and I think your group is amazing. But if you wanna take a look at the tour, uh, which I'm on, which I think has 70 events, and I'm plowing right through them. I'm in the high 20s, I think. Um, we'll just give you an idea of how on earth NAMI got to the USA Today bestseller list. It's our book. It's our community. And uh, I'll just tell you a little bit more about that. So uh, that guy on the left, that kid with the gigantic ears is me. And uh, this is my backstory on why I entered the field of psychiatry and why I'm so honored to be NAMI's medical director. Uh, my dad right there is a handsome, loving, gentle guy who became very ill and periodically manic and psychotic. And uh, we couldn't talk about that. This occurred first in my life when I was eight years old. I was making a blanket fort in the basement with books on top of things. I think every kid has done this. And I remember these gigantic booming sounds above me. I went up to inquire and I saw my father being carted away by the police. Nobody discussed this with me, of course. This was the 70s and the 60s, right? So this is back in the time when this was unimaginable that anybody would talk about this. We're then in a U-Haul driving to Michigan, 350 miles away. And I had to ask myself the question as an eight-year-old boy, does this move? to a place that we know no one away from all of our family have anything to do with that whole police at the door thing. And of course, later on, I learned that my dad had lost his job as a Chef Boyardee salesman and was offered a job in Detroit. And so as a result, I grew up in Michigan. I'm into college football. I think you are too in Montana. Um, I'm into polite driving, which is hilarious because I live in Boston. It's absolutely hilarious. People are giving me the finger and I'm waving them on. I still have these uh, Midwest features. I believe in public education, uh, you know, and I'm kind of chronically polite. So the fact that I grew up in Michigan wasn't bad for me, but the problem of not being able to talk about my dad's obvious vulnerability was critical in my search to become a psychiatrist. 
One of the things you don't know about your chief medical officer is I'm not particularly good at science and I'm terrible at calculus. And so the question is, how does a guy become a doctor uh, if he's not really that great at science and he's not that good at calculus? The answer, of course, is love. I want to understand what could help my dad and what could help other people. This is why I've been waiting for a practical book with wisdom from real people, real families. This is the book that I needed, my family needed, and I think my father, for all his shame and isolation, would have read when no one was looking. And so that was my vision for this book. And um, it turns out there are nine medical schools in America that didn't require calculus. I got into all of them. And so, you know, that's the joy of it. And as far as the problem of organic chemistry, there's this whole phenomenon known as tutors. And I hired them and I really battled through it. I majored in political science and history. I'm really not a science guy. I'm really into stories and history. And this, I think, is why this book uh, was my little creation. But I've hoped it captures Nami's story as well as humanly possible. Here's how I did the project. I did 130 interviews with volunteers who self-reported living with a mental health condition and families. Families use their real names, real stories, individuals, real names, real stories. Why is that important and why is that radical? All doctor books that I've seen say in the beginning, everyone in this book is private. Their identity has been hidden to protect their privacy. Sorry about my dog. Sorry about that. I'm not against privacy, and I don't think everybody should be out there with their story. But I felt, based on hanging around NAMI for all these years, that we would do well to consider inviting volunteers to share their truth. The book is about truth and their experience of truth, whatever it is. What treatments help them, what doctors discourage them, how doctors blamed families, how people found faith, peer leadership, supports, DBT, clozapine, whatever it is that helped people, this is what I wanted to get. But also from real people. I also ask America's best researchers to answer the questions that I get asked the most at the NAMI conventions. And all proceeds go to NAMI. The copyright belongs to NAMI. So uh, I can have signed multiple documents that I have no control, interest. My heirs have no control and interest in this book. This is our book in the most fundamental way. And I think it's one of the reasons we've been so successful is when people realize that this is our book, we benefit from this book and that people will know about NAMI and uh, we will generate the royalties will come to NAMI, not to me. Uh, I don't make a nickel if we sell 100,000. And we're on our way to selling a lot of books. We've done really well. The publisher is extremely happy with us. So uh, I had an interview protocol to make sure I wasn't re-traumatizing people. I checked in with people at the end of the interview. Was this okay for you? You know, you're going to take care of yourself this afternoon. For many people, it was a joy to tell their story. Some people found it upsetting, and I really did respect that. So I had an institutional review board. Just look over my little protocol. I did a phone call with people and I explained to them that this book is different than other mental health books. People would use their names in the service of helping others feel less alone. Hence the title of the book. I got some volunteers. I gave a talk at NAMI, Wisconsin. I said, anybody want to be in the book? Send me your email. You know, you have to use your name in the book. No worries if you're not ready for this. The plane is leaving. You know, you can have a seat on it if you want. Uh, I gave a talk to NAMI, Connecticut, NAMI, Georgia. Some people I knew through the NAMI community. I asked the Peer Leadership Council, would any of them like to be part of this book? And so some people are outside of the NAMI community. Lorenzo Lewis, who invented the Black Barbershop Mental Health Movement, is not a NAMI person per se. But I reached out to him because I felt like his story was important. Zoom was a friend to us. 
Uh, I was able to talk to Kumi McDonald in Hawaii and Eric Smith in San Antonio on the same day through the power of Zoom. Zoom also enabled me to send people their transcripts. Actually, Jordan Miller, my co-pilot, she did all the heavy lifting on this. Would you be willing to have this quote, which I think helps, could teach people the most in the book? And then people self-identified who they were. This is very important. If you identify as Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, that's up to you, not to me. So I took people at their word on their identity. 38 states, if this was an electoral college, NAMI would win. Let me close the door. You can hear I have a little, uh, my neighbor's doing some uh, active uh, mowing. Give me one second, just one second. I'm going to close the door. Apologies for that. Uh, so if this was an electoral college, NAMI would win. I interviewed people from 38 states, 11 self-identified race and ethnicities, across the spectrum of gender and sexuality, 25 different self-identified faith orientations, over 50 occupations, age 16 to 100. One woman told me she was old as dirt. <coughs> So I have to say that's indeterminate. That's how the book is organized. I'm hoping you'll buy it. But here's how I organized it. What we know and what we don't know. The lived experience is part two. Quotes from people, what they learned, what they went through, what they learned in their families becomes part of part three. Where I interviewed about 60 families how family to family made a difference for them, how they had to navigate the confusing and complex legal system, challenges with a chapter I call the hardest family questions, which are all the really hard questions that I've been asked at NAMI conventions, and then best practices, answers to some of those questions from leading researchers in America. Here are some of the leading researchers who participated. They cover a lot of organizations, including NIMH, University of Michigan, Columbia, Penn, <coughs> excuse me, Fountain House, America's first clubhouse. And you see the idea is I was trying to not neglect the research knowledge, but I wanted to make sure that we really focused on lived experience as expertise. Uh, it would, took a really big village to create this book. You can see me with two hands on my head. This is when the publisher said you got to go from 600 pages to 400 pages. I had fallen in love with so many of the amazing people in this book. Courageous leaders who were sharing their story. I was really struggling to figure out how to keep their quotes uh, smaller and how to pick the best quotes of them. So that's why I have two hands on my head. Jordan Miller, my co-pilot. She's a little more Zen than I am. She had one hand on her head. Alexis Zelensky, my other helper, she was completely calm. This gives you an idea of how many people contributed to our book. About 20 people on the NAMI staff, about six people in the NAMI Legends Division, retirees, uh, some our research assistants I hired, some friends, some people from Yale. <coughs> Our publisher provided editing. We have an amazing agent. NAMI has an agent now, and that's kind of fun. I'll tell you about the next book. And uh, Lisa Kaufman, who helped me with editing and writing. And then I had about 30 people review chapters. These are all people who hang out in this space. How could I make this chapter better to help people? So this was extremely a team sport. Here are the contributors who made such a difference. These are the real heroes of the book. These are people who share what they've learned in order to help other people. Uh, I'm happy to take your questions now. And I don't seem to have audio. And unfortunately, my neighbor's uh, lawn mowing is still going on. 
So I'm going to go on mute, wait for you to type in questions in the chat function, and then I'll jump back on. How does that sound? Uh, this next book is done by the same publisher. It's a parent guide, caregiver guide for children age zero to 18. So I want to invite you to ask me questions uh, in the chat function. So there is another NAMI book. And so we're going to have basically a series of books that will be in libraries and bookstores across America. And I'm very happy about that. What are some of the interview questions that I asked? So uh, I'm going to move to a different spot in my house because the uh, lawnmower guy and my neighbor is now on the other side of me. Uh, the questions I asked were open-ended questions. So let's take people who were first-person lived experience. I would say to them, tell me a little about, a bit about your journey. When did you first notice something might be going on? How might you define recovery? What lessons would you say you could take away from your experience? These are pretty open-ended questions. And I encourage people to talk to me either chronologically, working from the beginning to the today, today back to the beginning. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold as well. Identifying themes in their stories that they thought might be helpful to others. For family members, I ask them what they've learned from their journey in loving someone with a mental health condition. Very open-ended questions. And I followed the lead of people in the interview conversation. So that's a good example. Open-ended questions. I then checked in with people. How was this for you? Are you okay now? Is talking about this been upsetting for you? Most people said it was liberating. Most people said it was a positive experience. Most people said they were so delighted that the story might help others. That was the most recurrent response that people had. My story could help another person makes it all worthwhile. So uh, that's the essence of the structure. I had some basic themes uh, that I wanted to pursue, but I also listened to people. Some people told me things that I didn't know to ask. I talked to a man who said that AOT saved his life and I had to learn all about his experience of the criminal justice system. I talked to a man who was homeless and a veteran who went on to become a peer leader. And his journey around that had been quite difficult and longstanding. And so what I found was people went in different directions throughout our project. And I, what I did is my best to honor what they had to say and to honor their experience. I used to lose sleep worrying that I would find a quote or frame a quote in a way that someone didn't like. It was, a it was a trying adventure for me. Now, remember, this is something I wanted to do for 15 years for NAMI, and I got to do it. So I got to live an actual dream of mine. Um, so, but the anxiety that I had about harming anyone or getting anyone's quote wrong or framing it wrong was intense. Uh, and that's why we kept checking with people. Is this okay? Is this okay? So those are the essence of the questions uh, that I went through. Um, have I considered putting the outtakes on the website? Uh, I think we're going to sell 50,000 books before we do any other material. I have incredible material for a podcast. I have all these incredible interviews. No one agreed to be on a podcast or to have their voice or likeness used. I'd have to go back and ask them. Uh, the publisher is extremely happy with us. We've sold about 20,000 books in three weeks and change. Uh, most books don't sell 500 copies. So I want you to know that we are doing extremely well. So I'm not planning to do any other pieces on the website. I will say the outtakes would be gorgeous. You could write a whole nother book just using the outtakes. 
because the people that I interviewed were amazing. Their stories were beautiful and touching and sometimes very sad and challenging. And what we have in our community is a whole group of resilient people. I want to tell you how to buy the book. Um, if you go on Amazon, Amazon has it down to 18 bucks off the original price of 29 bucks. And I asked the publisher, is that a good thing or a bad thing? They said, that's an amazing thing because they see the book is selling. So they want to beat the independent bookstores. I happen to love independent bookstores. And if you have a favorite one in Missoula or Bozeman or Helena, wherever it may be, I encourage you to go and buy the book in person. And, you know, make sure they know that we care about this book. One of the other tricks you do when you're in a bookstore, if you consider this your book, as I consider this your book, is uh, take it deep in the shelves and put it on the top of the display case. It'll take them six to eight hours to figure it out. And in the meantime, someone else might learn about the book. So I do think Eleanor's question is a good one. There may be other developments from this project. Putting the outtakes on the website is one idea. Having a podcast is another idea. Obviously, every single person would have to be asked if they were okay with that, if they wanted to be on a podcast. But frequently when I'm contacted by media people, I will say, does anybody want to participate um, you know, in this conversation with WebMD, uh, with the New York Times? This is the kind of things that's coming my way. So Eleanor, an excellent question. And we're still trying to make sense of it. The publisher does want to sell books. So I'm guessing, uh, I will bring this up with our Marcom team. I will bring this up with our Marcom team uh, about your idea of putting some of the outtakes on the website. So uh, I happen to love podcasts too, Eleanor. So thank you for that. If you do buy the book through Amazon, I want you to encourage you, if you like the book, to rate it five stars. Why? Amazon ratings are the single biggest driver of sales right now. The Amazon reviews are extremely positive, and I've yet to see a NAMI name that I recognize on any Amazon review. Not yet one person. There's 88 reviews. Now, I don't know everybody at NAMI, and a few of the people who wrote the reviews are my friends or family. A few. Not a lot. Um, it still has five stars. And if you purchase the book through Amazon, which is now $18 instead of $29, um, if you like the book, I would encourage you to rate it five stars because it is, in fact, our book. If you don't like the book, I would encourage you to take a vacation or have a cup of coffee and take a walk. Um, have you thought of making an hour storybook? Tell me more about that. I tried someone's experience with mental health. I think that's what I did in the book. I really tried to make this a book about storytelling. First person experience as expertise. What did you learn? What have you been through? When did you first notice it? So if you buy the book and read it, I think, I hope you will find that this is a collection of real people's experience, their stories with the intentional design to help other people and have them feel less alone. Um, our story, I'm also going to interpret that potentially as the NAMI history. I interviewed Eleanor Owen, who was the last person to my knowledge who was alive, who was at the first NAMI convention. And I, about 1% to 2% of the book is the NAMI history. I interviewed Lori Flynn, who was the executive director from, I think, 1988 to 2000 on our first effort to double the NIMH budget. That's an advocacy triumph. That's in the advocacy chapter. So the NAMI story, uh, NAMI's history is threaded through the book. My little personal story and experience is threaded through the book. The essence of the book is 130 people share what they learned, who they are. They are just like you and me. And that's the beauty of this entire project. Could this concept be turned into a NAMI course on its own? That's probably, it's a good question. It might be above my pay grade. Uh, Terry Brister, of course, is the 
master and commander of all of our programs. Um, you know, I'll chat with her. We're still learning. We've only been, the book's been up for one month. One month, we've sold 20,000 books. Again, most books sell 500 copies. So I want you to know we are doing extremely well. We are the number new one new release on Amazon. We hit the USA Today bestseller list. We are thriving. Uh, question, how long did it take from start to finish? Excellent question. So um, to the team from Flathead, I've been thinking about this exact book for a decade. I really wanted real people's voices to have a platform. And I know that's very countercultural in the field of psychiatry, because most psychiatry books are, here's what I've learned, here's what you need to do. I, Ken, felt that we had really neglected the wisdom of people who've lived with things in their families and themselves. So the idea has been percolating for 10 years. I took a course on how to write a book for healthcare professionals at Harvard three years in a row in 17, 18, and 19. And I went to this course with this book in mind. The end of 17, I thought, I have no chance. I went the second time, I thought, maybe I have a chance. And then the third time I thought, you know, I wonder if someday I could have a chance. Then COVID happened. And my experience with the media was the media wanted to talk about what helps people, recovery, isolation, teletherapy, relapse, addiction, all the things that I wanted to talk about. So I met with Dan Gillis and I said, Dan, I've been wanting to write this book for a decade. I think society is ready for it based on the questions I'm getting from the media. Dan Gillison said, go. So uh, that was two years ago and change. To make a long story short, I had to write a 60 page book proposal, which took me six months, which was, you know, what is this book? How is it gonna be? How does my little story, how does NAMI's platform, what are other books like it in the space? But once I got the contract, I basically stopped it doing every other thing. And I worked on it about 12 hours a day, every single day. And I built an enormous team. So I would say we delivered the book on time, met every publisher's deadline. Uh, and that's how this book is out in the fall. You'll notice in the spring, there's going to be about 50 mental health books that'll start raining all over bookstores and libraries. We own the fall. And that was because we were ahead of it. That, you know, I'd been meditating on this idea of our book for a very long time. And when the CEO said, just go, just do it, there was no hesitation on Dan's part at all. So I would say 10 years is an idea. Six months, solid six months to find an agent. We do have one agent, same agent for Christine Crawford's book for parents and caregivers. And uh, six months to write a book proposal, which was really hard. So we send the book proposal through our agent to publishers. Five publishers bid on our book. There was kind of a bidding war for our book. How about that? How fun is that? So the answer is uh, a year, when you think about it narrowly, two years and a half, about two years, uh, when you think about finding an agent, which I had never done before, I never wrote a book before, and finding and creating a 60 page book proposal. So you pitch it to publishers and they say, oh, okay, this is NAMI, NAMI's a big group. The publisher, Molly Stern, who won our bid, uh, had edited Michelle Obama's Becoming, which is the best-selling biography in American history. She formed her own company called Zando, and You Are Not Alone was her first book. One of the things she did uh, was she called her sister-in-law, who is a social worker, who said, I love NAMI, and I would love to read their book. So how fun is that? So uh, I think Molly Stern made the decision. Uh, the cover's beautiful. The print is beautiful. It's professional. It doesn't look like I used a mimeograph machine in my basement. Like we got an A plus hot publisher uh, to support NAMI's mission. They are also supporting the next book, which Christine Crawford is working on. So we have a publishing arm. How fun is that?
Aw, here's a love note. You knocked it out of the park. What's your next book idea? Okay, this is a really good question. And I want to thank you for even answering, asking the question, because all I'm doing is touring and talking about our book. You know, NAMI is a second family to me. It is a tremendous honor to promote our book. And I'm on the Dr. Drew podcast, podcasts you've never heard of radio stations across the country, like I'm all over it. If you have connections in Montana, I'll be honored to do a radio spot. And I'll ask my friends in Montana if they want to join me. I just did one for a Boston radio with a young woman from the book. The second book, as you know, is in process. It's interesting. I wasn't able to tap into the Native American community. And on the book tour, I've met people who feel like That is a set of stories that also could be told. I wouldn't write that book. People in that community would write that book. I've been contacted by several people who've lost family members, who've died by suicide, who want to write a memoir, and whether that should be NAMI's next book. These are all people that are now coming to me because even though I'm a rookie author, I did write a book. It did sell well. And it's getting a lot of five-star ratings. Like, we did it together. And that's very kind of you to say that. Another idea is a book for young adults, by young adults. So these would be people who are in that 18 to 30 range. So again, I don't know what the third book will be. Nami's going to have a line of books. And I'm so happy about that. I can almost not put it into words. Anytime I go all across America, I'm going to walk into a bookstore when I'm visiting my family in Philadelphia. I'm going to sneak into a bookstore and sign three books, you know, and put them on the front of the, uh, you know, little display case. And then the guy will say, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, hey, this is Nami's book. Let's go. So it's an excellent question. My email is ken at nami.org. If you have an idea for our next book, I can make no promises. I have no idea what's going to happen. This is the one book I wanted to write. But now I see that NAMI has real game. Like we are selling books across America. Our community is winning at this. And um, because all the royalties come back to NAMI, it's been really easy for me to promote the book with no guilt at all. None. Like, let's go. And so um, those are some ideas. I'm Ken at NAMI.org if you have another idea. I can't make any promises about what the publisher will want to do, but I think we've started something big and I think there is other possibilities. There are 11 pirated workshop workbooks on Amazon. I'm not making this up. So if you look at You Are Not Alone, Ken Duckworth, on Amazon, five stars, I would encourage you to add stars if you like the book. And um, there's 11 pirated, pirated, Uh, workbooks. Hi, this is not authorized by NAMI or Dr. Ken Duckworth. This is a workbook to help you read Ken Duckworth's book. The next book, hi, I'm selling a summary of NAMI's book for $3.99 on Kimball. All rights reserved to me. And I'm like, dude, whatever happened to copyright law? Like whatever happened to copyright law? So one obvious thing is there's probably a need for us to do some workbooks related to this. And so you know, I just want to say I apologize for my uh, inability to hear you this morning. I apologize for my lawnmower problem, wandering around to get into a room that was a little quieter. You've been very patient with me. And I really just want to thank you for your support and your interest. One of the reviews said on Amazon, what people have said to me a hundred times, I wish I had this book nine years ago. It would have helped my family. NAMI is the greatest organization I could ever imagine, and I'm so honored to be your steward, your servant in creating a message for us that's traveling across the country and is winning is winning the book game. It's really fun. There's an audio book. I've had several people ask me, I don't like to read books. I like to listen to books. Well, of course, I tried out to read my own book, and I was told I was not a professional. I should hit the road. But I did uh, get to read the introduction. And that meant a lot to me because that's my little story about my dad, how we got into this whole thing. 
and how the book is designed, what NAMI is, and why this book. So if you listen to the audio book, you'll hear my voice, and then they'll have an actual professional read the rest of the book. And uh, so I just want to say thank you for your attention. Again, I'm Ken at, Ken at NAMI.org. Send me an email on any idea if you're working on a book. I'm not an expert on how to write a book, but I did write a book. So I have one book under my belt. So um, if you have any other questions or anything, I'm thinking uh, it's 10 minutes to the hour. And uh, I want to make sure you guys get a break of some sort. I haven't heard from my, uh, you know, moderator whether we should, you know, I should stop. But I'll take a few more questions until I get the actual hook if you're interested. So uh, rural mental health, that's a topic that could be a book. Would you agree? So, you know, we can't chat because of the chat function, but I think rural mental health has demonstrated some real challenges in addition to Native American and in addition to indigenous mental health. One more question, says Nami Montana, my hosts. One more question. Shared a story within the story? Like, what was something or someone's story that surprised you? Ooh, what a good question, Mary. Such a good question. So when I wrote the book proposal, which is like you to say, here's the thing you're going to buy. So you have to really put a lot of effort into it, a couple hundred hours, to really pitch this idea. I had a chapter called The Power of Community. And I was thinking Fountain House. I was thinking the Depressed Cake Shop. I was thinking the Me Too Orchestra, all amazing groups. But what the thing that was the most important thing that I learned in this was the power of peers, the power of first person lived experience in helping each other and the power of peers in families. And uh, that was a big takeaway for me because even though I would describe myself as an extremely recovery oriented psychiatrist, I wasn't really taught that what was helping people in the hospitals was the next person in the hospital. Several people told me exactly that. So the doctors never said, oh, really, what's, what's also going on right here is the next person in the next room that's helping them saying, I've been there, I've been like you. So the chapter changed from the power of community to the power of peers and community. So I interviewed people who became peer specialists, people who've helped each other informally, people who are participating in the community with an openness about their vulnerabilities. So that's how the chapter changed. I'm sorry to report, I could have written a chapter with terrible things mental health practitioners have said to people. I really want you to know, I really struggled with whether to have a chapter on that because that also surprised me because I've never told anyone they would never get better. I mean, I'm not that good. How the heck would I know what a person's going to be like in five years or what treatment came? Because I'm trying to sell this book to mental health practitioners, social workers, systems of care, and psychiatrists, I only told two or three stories in a chapter called Themes of Recovery. And one was don't believe a negative prognosis. And I only told a few stories. So one thing surprised me, which was the peer movement is much more powerful than even I thought. And the family peer movement, families to families is more powerful than I thought. And the fact that mental health practitioners have occasionally, I'm sorry to say, I think 30 or 40 people said they were told discouraging or inappropriate or blaming things by mental health practitioners. It was kind of heartbreaking to me. And uh, I'm really trying to change that. But I decided not to have a chapter on it because I didn't want it to become an anti-mental health practitioner. That was my opinion. Tough call. Because again, I was trying to honor people's experience. Joyce Berland was blamed for her in her family for her daughter's schizophrenia. Like Lori Flynn told me you had to pay psychiatry to get blamed. Like this is what people told me. So I included a few of them. But you're right, Mary. Um, maybe the discrimination bias could come in another book. Right. Um, you know, it's just something to think about 
you know, it's been a dream for me. I want to thank you for your attention, your kindness. Thank you for putting up with my uh, neighbor's lawnmower and my dog and everything else. And I just want to say, you know, I love NAMI Montana. I've been there before. You're a fantastic organization. If you'd like me to come at a future date, I would be honored to attend. It just didn't happen to work given the speed and intensity of the book tour. So again, if you have any questions for me personally, I am Ken at NAMI.org. And uh, being your chief medical officer is my dream job. And this book is our book. And thank you.